So I'm uh, Bob Carey. I'm president of the New School. I was asked by Joel Towers to introduce him and to welcome Bill McKibben uh, to our campus. Uh, uh, I uh, do so now. I welcome uh, you, Bill, here. I uh, thank you very much, especially in advance of uh, you know, the very exciting day on Saturday uh, that you've been uh, instrumental in organizing that I presume that both you and Joel will speak a bit about. Uh, I told uh, Mr. McKibben that I, in my remarks that I was going to mention a, a project that uh, I've uh, been asked to be a part of, which is I'm, I'm on the board of the National Resources Defense Council and uh, climate change legislation is the top of their agenda. And I have the, uh, I would say, unenviable task of trying to persuade a group of eight to 10 senators to vote in the affirmative. Um, and have, as a consequence of that, uh, discovered a rather dismaying, uh, uh, I think, fact, which is uh, climate change legislation is gonna be exceptionally difficult to pass. Um, I would say, uh, certainly in 2009 with healthcare, dominating the gender, but perhaps even in 2010, unless uh, we as Americans begin to see the issue differently than we do today, um, or um, perhaps not all Americans, but certainly the way that we at the NRDC have been attempting to frame this issue that uh, we can, in other words, that, that you can in the aggregate not have job loss, that you can create green jobs and you don't have to worry about uh, this producing anything bad, it's all gonna be good, as sort of the setup for the uh, op-ed piece that uh, Senator John uh, Kerry and Lindsey Graham uh, wrote last week in the New York Times uh, uh, plotted as a potential compromise for climate change legislation. Uh, my own view is that, that uh, uh, there, there's two possibilities in looking at the facts. Uh, you either uh, believe after looking at the facts that we have a serious uh, problem on our hands, a very serious problem on our hands which could transform the nature of life on Earth, or you don't. And I will say, Bill, that I was upset to discover that there are some individuals who I previously regarded as intelligent who uh, are now in the Senate who've re reached the conclusion that it isn't a problem. Um, but there were also senators in 1964 who had reached the conclusion that uh, Jim Crow laws weren't a problem uh, when civil rights was being debated uh, that summer. I uh, noted that the civil rights legislation of 64 and the voting rights legislation of 65 were an even larger interference in the marketplace than climate change legislation. Uh, there was substantial interference with, with almost everything that was going on in the United States of America at the time. It transformed the workplace, it transformed education, but it was a major interference on the part of the federal government. And you either believe that the discrimination that was in place at the time was wrong, or you didn't. And if you believe it was wrong, you voted in the affirmative. And if you believe that it wasn't wrong, you voted no. My view of climate change uh, uh, and climate change legislation that comes out of identifying that as a problem has to be considered in the same fashion. Uh, if you believe it's a, it's, a, it's a problem and a moral challenge, uh, you have to vote in the affirmative. You do not want history to record that you voted no. Um, uh, when I was in the Senate, I knew uh, members of the Senate who were there in 1964 and who had voted no on civil rights because they represented southern states and they have never permanently got over it. Uh, they are ashamed of the fact that they voted no on civil rights. And uh, when I talk to members of the Senate, that's what I say. I think if you vote in the negative, uh, you will likewise, the older you get, you will look back on that negative vote and you will be ashamed of that vote. Uh, so unless, in my view, it is framed in that kind of moral context, it's very difficult uh, to get into the uh, uh, almost the economic development argument that you can create more jobs and are might likely to be destroyed. I happen to believe that you can with the right investment strategy, but I don't think it rings the bell sufficiently, particularly given the current economic conditions, to get people finally to say, uh, damn the consequences, I'm going to vote yes. Uh, that's my political uh, uh, lay of the land. I told Bill that I would uh, do that in advance of my primary responsibility here, which is to uh, now welcome to this podium, ladies and gentlemen, the Dean of Parsons New School for Design, Joel Towers. Thank you. Very good work. Have a Just to uh, uh, continue the trend that uh, President Kerry uh, began around technology, I'm supposed to ask you to turn off your cell phones. Um, and uh, it is a great, great pleasure, really a deep honor to, um, to be able to welcome you here, uh, Bill, tonight for this talk. 
Uh, I wanted to just frame for you a couple of, um, for our guests uh, from outside the university, a couple of key points about what we're doing here and why um, it's extremely natural that we have Bill Gibbon here tonight. <clears throat> In part, it's because of two new programs that we've started at the new school, focusing on the environment, uh, a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Studies. Um, truly innovative uh, new programs. They're administrated by the Tishman Environment and Design Center, which is led by two of our most remarkable faculty, Nevin Cohen and Cameron Tonkinwise, are co-chairs of the center, and um, with a group of uh, faculty from across the university uh, who form a core leadership team within the center, uh, are able to um, bring to life a program that emphasizes urban ecosystems, sustainable design, and public policy. We entered into this for many reasons, not the least among them, the reality that by 2025, a majority of the world's population will live and work and play in large urban areas. Our program focuses on urban ecosystems, and it uses New York City as one of the most complex urban ecosystems on Earth as its laboratory, a place for study of the environment and for the answering the questions of sustainability. And we look to creative design to find solutions at the intersection between those areas of policy, management, economics, and science. At the New School, I think, I believe very strongly that we are extremely well positioned to become a leader in the field of urban environmental design. Learning about and engaging with the environment involves the integration of many disciplines, and that's one of the key areas where I think New School can distinguish itself because of the particular blend of um, colleges and faculties that we have across this university. Um, our ability to link the social sciences, the natural sciences, design and policy positions us in a very strong way to be able to address this key question of the intersection of urban environments and design. The Tishman Center is a place for students and faculty from all colleges and schools to gather, to interact, and explore shared experiences, and it facilitates outreach research, curriculum development, internships, field work opportunities, and events like this tonight. It stimulates critical thinking and builds relationships through lectures, public programs, and workshops. I would be, it is a tremendous honor for me to introduce Bill McKibben, and I'm going to tell you a couple of things about him that you probably already know because you're all here uh, based on his tremendous um, uh, history and commitment and resume. Um, he is a rock star in the area that we, uh, the, the tree huggers among us would, uh, uh, would certainly consider him that, and I am um, certainly one of those. So uh, I would like to mention to you just one other thing um, about the new school before giving you Bill's, a brief, brief bio on Bill's work. Uh, and that is that I hope that you will join his group, and Bill will talk about 350.org. Um, he is advertising it on his shirt tonight. Um, he has advertised it pretty much everywhere across the planet. Um, but we do hope that you will join uh, the, uh, the events this coming Saturday um, for an International Day of Climate Action, which will be a series of rallies and awareness uh, raising uh, creative action staged in virtually every country on Earth. Um, it's designed to assemble, and I quote here, a gigantic global visual petition for change to be presented in Copenhagen, where we will also be represented at the new school uh, this December, when the world's nations meet to agree on a new climate treaty. For our part, New School Renew Students, here's a plug for um, one of our terrific groups here at the university, will be rowing a fleet of boats built by Lang students at our Lang on the Hudson program, which is led by Rob Buchanan, another one of the faculty in the Tishman Environment and Design Center, um, who uh, builds these really fantastic boats every year. And they'll be, built, they'll be rowing around the Battery and up the East River on the UN, which is just another example of a course that takes students off campus and out into the urban environment. Bill McKibben, known to all of us uh, in this room as an environmentalist, a writer, uh, a leading voice on global warming and alternative energy, and an advocate for more localized economies. Scholar in residence at Middlebury College, he directs Middlebury's uh, Fellowship in Environmental Journalism and is a fellow at the Post Carbon Institute. He's a frequent contributor uh, to the New York Times, the Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, um, Orion, Mother Jones, National Geographic, and Rolling Stone, further evidence of your rock star status. Um, the End of Nature, his first book, is regarded 
in many circles as really the first book for a general audience about climate change. It's been printed in more than 20 languages. Wandering Home, another book, is about a long solo hiking trip from his current home in the mountains east of Lake Champlain back to his longtime home uh, in the Adirondacks. Deep Economy, The Wealth of Communities and a Durable Future, published in 2007, was a national bestseller, addressing the shortcomings of the growth economy and envisions a transition to a more local scale enterprise. Set It Up 07 was a na nationwide grassroots environmental campaign started by McKibben to demand action on climate warming by the US Congress. And I think President Kerry addressed some of the challenges there moments ago. The group organizes rallies in hundreds of American cities and towns and on April 14, 2007, demanded that Congress enact curbs on climate emissions by 80% by 2050. In the fall of 07, he published with other members of Set It Up, uh, flight, uh, uh, the team, Fight Global Warming Now, a handbook for activists trying to organize local communities. In the wake of these tremendous successes, um, they announced the new campaign, which he will, I hope, talk to you about tonight, called 350.org. It has offices and organizations in North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, South America, and is spreading the word around the 350 parts per million um, threshold that, uh, that is uh, established in many, many people's minds as a boundary we need to um, not move beyond uh, or get back to and not move beyond. This October 24th, 350 is organizing uh, the um, International Day of Climate Action, which I just mentioned to you and which Bill will talk about. He's been awarded both the Guggenheim Fellowship in 93, the Lindenhurst Fellowship, and he won the Lannan Literary Award for Nonfiction Writing in 2000. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Bill McKibben. Joel, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. It's uh, a great pleasure to look around and see some old friends and, and uh, also to get to thank uh, Rob Buchanan for inviting me here and also for organizing this sort of 350 Navy for Saturday. We're very grateful for that. I think I am, can you hear me if I speak into my lapel? Okay, that's what I will do. I got to tell you, you're getting me at somewhat less than my best tonight, and I apologize for that. We're at the ragged end of a long stretch, and I've been traveling the last few months, a kind of travel that I do not recommend. I just returned from a, a, a trip that took me to five continents in nine days. Um, the amount of carbon that I have spewed into the atmosphere is almost incalculable. I'm pretty worn out. But the one good result is that I'll be able to tell you in the course of the evening about the truly exciting sense that around the world a movement is taking shape, a really profound movement finally about this biggest problem we've ever faced. And I will get back to that in a few minutes. But you don't invite someone whose most well-known book is called The End of Nature to come talk without expecting at least a little bumming out, you know, um, <laughs> in the process. So that's what we're going to do for a few minutes. I know that you all know all about climate change. I just want to make sure that everyone's on the same page scientifically, that you understand exactly where we are right now so that you have a sense of why the urgency is so extreme, why it is that we're working at the pace we're working. As Joel said, 20 years ago this fall, when I was 27, I published The End of Nature, which was the first book for a general audience about climate change. And I should say at the time, being 27, it was my assumption that were I to write a book about this and people to read it, that would take care of the problem. And, and we would go to work. I was 
too recently removed from college, I believe, and retained too strong an idea of the power of books. Um, but the only thing that we didn't thoroughly understand in, 2000 and in, in 1989 that we understand now was how fast this was going to happen how quickly we were going to see real and large effects from global warming. We knew that carbon trapped heat. We knew carbon was accumulating in the atmosphere. We had a rough idea over how, over the millennia, how this would play out. But we didn't know where the red line was. And of course, being human, the sort of hope was that it was some distance in the future. Um, mostly so that it would then become somebody else's problem to deal with, you know. Anybody who was still maintaining that illusion but paying attention to the science had those hopes once and for all dashed in the summer of 2007. In the summer of 2007, we saw the extremely rapid melt of sea ice across the Arctic. Okay? In about six weeks, the Arctic went from the state where it had been, more or less, for not only all of human history, but long eons before that, to a new state. By the end of that summer, there was 25% less ice in the Arctic than there had been a year before. The northeast and northwest passages were simultaneously open. You could circumnavigate the Arctic on open water. The Earth viewed from outer space by September of 2007 looked completely different than it would have from a satellite a year before or indeed a million years before. Okay. That scared people who were paying attention. I started getting calls, often late at night, from scientists that I'd known for a quarter century, who'd always been concerned and worried and working hard, and now were panicked. Because it was very clear that climate change was happening more quickly and on a larger scale than even the dire forecasts had anticipated. And as people looked out around the globe more closely, really we found that that same kind of off the scale, way ahead of schedule change was happening in almost every major physical feature that we could really survey. Arctic ice, for instance, was not the only thing that was melting. High altitude glaciers begun to melt much, much more rapidly than we thought they would. That's a deep and serious problem. Uh, earlier this year, researchers in Bolivia went up to survey at the end of the Southern Hemisphere summer went to survey uh, Chacoltaya, which would, one time was the highest ski area on Earth and a, a, a big glacier. It had been melting this fall when they got there. There was no glacier left at all, just rocks and mud. That was it. The rest of the glaciers in the Andes are going the same way. And so even more dangerously are the glaciers in the high Himalayas. I was recently in an area in Tibet, roughly the size of Italy, whose glaciated fields contain the headwaters of the Mekong, the Solween, the Yangtze, the Yellow, the Ganges, and the Brahmaputra. One in three human beings lives downstream. Okay? And that's why they live where they live. For the 10,000 years of the Holocene, it's been warm enough that our continental interiors were free of ice and you could grow grain on them, but cold enough that you had this permanent storage of water up in the highlands that would melt in the summer and provide necessary water. Not much longer. The most recent estimate is that, for instance, Gangotri, the great glacier at the head of the Ganges, may be gone by 2035. 400 million people in India depend on the Ganges for their drinking water and their irrigation. There is not a backup plan for what they do if that begins to falter. Not just glaciers. Hydrology, the way that water moves around the planet, is clearly shifting and shifting dramatically. Warm air holds more water vapor than cold. That's why we've seen big increases in evaporation in arid areas, okay? and with it, drought. 
I was in Australia recently. Australia is just is coming through the worst droughts it's ever recorded. Uh, in February, after the hottest, driest three weeks on record, uh, the suburbs of Melbourne caught fire. In the course of an hour, about 200 people died in the suburbs of a prosperous western city. You saw the pictures a couple of weeks ago of a great red cloud of dust sweeping across Sydney. The Water Association in Australia said recently that they were not going to refer to what was going on there any longer as a drought because drought implied that it would come to an end at some point. They think it's the new normal. Once all that water is up in the air, it's going to come down. And so in wet areas, we're seeing these big increases in precipitation, really violent precipitation, deluge, downpour. The tropical Atlantic's been pretty calm this summer. The tropical Pacific has seen a chain of typhoons that have produced rainfalls like almost nobody on Earth has ever seen. Earlier this summer, uh, Typhoon Morakot crossed Taiwan. It stayed stationary, in fact, over Taiwan for about three days. And in parts of the mountains, in the course of that three days, managed to drop nine and a half feet of water. Okay? The villages that it dropped it on aren't there anymore. Um, um, uh, you don't even have to believe the scientists on this stuff. Ask the insurance companies. Look at what happens to the payouts uh, uh, for damage from storm year after year after year. I could go on like this, believe me, for a very long time. Um, suffice it to say that all of this has happened that we see so far with a one degree increase in the global average temperature of the planet. 20 years ago, we did not think that one degree would be enough to do this. We thought it would bring you just to the kind of threshold of global warming. Big change would still be a couple of degrees and hence some decades in the future. We were wrong. The planet was more finely balanced than people realized. The addition of about two watts per square meter of solar energy to the Earth's surface was enough to cause really big changes. And what's scary is that the consensus, by no means the worst case scenarios, the absolute middle of the road consensus of climatologists is that without dramatic, sharp reductions in carbon emissions now, we'll see another four or five degrees of temperature increase in the course of this century. If one degree is enough to melt the Arctic, okay, we do not want to find out what four or five degrees is going to do. Everything that we can forecast about it is grim. And just pick an area, agriculture. The most recent studies uh, uh, make it clear that with that kind of temperature increase, we'd see huge declines in the productivity of agriculture because our main crops, you know, corn and wheat and rice, are adapted to the kind of climate that we've enjoyed for the last 10,000 years when those crops have been patiently evolved. They can't deal with temperatures past a certain point. Think about disease spreading fast already as mosquitoes who really like the warmer, wetter world that we're building expand their range dramatically. I was in Dhaka not that long ago for their first big outbreak of dengue fever, a disease that's gone up about 200% this decade across Asia and South America. Okay? I was spending a lot of time in the slums, so I eventually got bit by the wrong mosquito, and I came down with dengue, and I was as sick as I've ever been, but I obviously didn't die. A lot of people did die who were sick or poor or whatever, malnourished going in. It was instructive, I'll add as an aside, to sit in the hospital there in a huge ward full of people sick and dying from this thing and realize that they had done nothing whatsoever to cause it. You can't even measure the amount of carbon that the 140 million people who live in Bangladesh emit. It's a rounding error in the international tables, you know. The 4% of us in this country, 25% of the world's CO2. If there's 100 people in a bed in Bangladesh in a hospital, 25 of them are our responsibility at some level. Security. The Estimates, the new computer models and estimates for how many climate refugees we can expect by mid-century if we allow the temperature to warm, uh, on the high side, go up to about 700 million people leaving their homes because they're too 
dry or because they're underwater. Try to imagine a world where one in 10 of the current population is on the move trying to find a new house. Try to think what kind of security or peace or anything else is possible in a world like that. The only good thing that's come out of the last couple of years is a much surer sense among scientists of exactly where we need to go and what we need to do. We now have a number to describe our peril, and it's the most important number in the world. Once that ice began to melt, once these other changes were clear, our best scientists went back to work. And your uh, Manhattan neighbor, James Hansen, the NASA scientist who has the biggest computer model of the climate to run it for the longest time, produced the best and earliest paper with his team in January of 08 that identified this number, 350 parts per million CO2, as the bottom line. Above it, they said, if you had carbon in the atmosphere greater than 350 parts per million, you couldn't have a planet similar to the one on which civilization developed and to which life on Earth is adapted. Okay? That's pretty strong language. But everything we've learned since makes it appear that they were right. In fact, there was a paper published last week, a big study in science, Aradna Tripathi's group at UCLA published a really powerful paper that extended the carbon record back about 15 million years for the first time. And what it found was that it's been 15 million years since there was as much carbon in the atmosphere as there is now, closing in on 400 parts per million. And that when there was, it caused the oceans to rise about 100 feet, okay? A completely different and completely untenable world for us. We're at 390 parts per million now. We are too high. Global warming is not a future threat. It's not something we need to take precautions against. It's not something we need to slow down our emissions to prevent someday. It is happening right now. It is an enormous crisis, the biggest crisis we've ever faced. It's breaking over our heads, and we have very limited time in which to solve it. It's not like other problems that we face, because if you walk away from it for a while, it doesn't just sit there and wait for you to come back and solve it. It's not like healthcare, where you mess it up at the beginning of the Clinton administration, and 20 years later, it's still there to try to solve, you know? This one's not like that. There's, for instance, an ungodly amount of methane, CH4, another global warming gas, trapped beneath the permafrost of, that lies beneath the tundra and the taiga of the far north. If we warm it enough to melt that permafrost and that methane escapes, then it won't matter if we turn off every car and shut down every power plant on the face of the earth. We will have heated things enough to start this thing on an, un, on an irrevocable downhill slide. The last two years, the amount of methane in the atmosphere has begun to spike sharply upward. As far as we can tell, it's because that kind of melting is beginning. We can't let it go on. It is an incredibly tough number, 350. There's nothing easy about it. Meeting it would require bigger changes in human economic and political systems than anything we've ever tried to do. And it's not clear, completely clear, that we can do it. But there's a pretty good chance we could if we bent all of our efforts toward it. That's what it will take. That's what it implies. That's why it's a scary number. That's why I wish I didn't have to tell you about it tonight, in a sense. But I do because the most important thing to understand when we think about these questions is that at heart, they're not political questions. The negotiations that we do in the Senate or in Copenhagen or whatever else, yes, are negotiations between Republicans and Democrats, between industry and environment, between China and the US, but they're really negotiations between human beings on the one hand and physics and chemistry on the other. 
And that's a hell of a tough negotiation because physics and chemistry really are not good at negotiation. All right? They pretty much state their bottom line and they've pretty much stated it. From what we can tell, it's 350 parts per million. And they're unlikely to say, oh, you're in an economic hard patch, we'll suspend the laws of nature for a little while till you get it together. They're unlikely to reward good intentions, you know, or to say to Barack Obama, well, you're new in the job, you know, and, and whatever, we'll give you a little slack. It's the job of our political systems to meet their demands. Even the most talented politicians in the world are unable to amend the laws of nature, so we've got to figure out how to meet that challenge. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. I'm done talking about science. I'm going to talk about political science, I guess, for a minute. Let me say in passing that I could insert a long discussion here of engineering, but I'm not going to because I think that's by far the easiest part of the problem. I think the engineers, like the scientists, have more or less done their job and given us most of what we need to deal with this problem Mostly it's there and on the shelf for readily foreseeable, uh, 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 possible to get at. The thing that we're lacking, the thing that we're lacking is the political will to make it happen quickly enough to matter. As well as the scientific method has worked, and it has worked well, reaching a robust conclusion about a difficult problem in a short order of time. As well as it's worked, that's how badly the political method has failed here and around the world, okay? And that's what we somehow have to change. How do we build that political will? Before I say any more, I should issue a caveat. Um, I'm talking, let me get a little water too before I say any more. I'm talking as if um, I know the answer to this question, okay? And I'm gonna speak confidently in things, because that's my manner. But, in fact, no one really knows the answer to these questions. Um, no one really knows how to build movements. Uh, it's not a scientific question. It's some incredible mix of, uh, uh, of trying to figure out how to work with the zeitgeist and, 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 and do what you can at any given moment. So instead of really uh, preaching at you, I'm just going to tell you a few stories okay, about what I've been doing for the last couple of years. When I came back from that trip to Bangladesh, some part of me wanted to do more than just write and speak about these questions, because I'd been doing that pretty faithfully for 15 years, and really it didn't seem to me we were getting much of anywhere, and lots of other people were doing it. But I didn't know what to do. I'm a writer. I live in Vermont, um, in the woods. Writers are not activists. They're people who are self-selected to sit in their room and type, you know. Um, 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 I really was remarkably clueless. But I wanted to do something. I called up a few of my writer friends in Vermont said, look, we're going to go up to Burlington, which is our main city, 50,000 people, so not, but it's as good as we've got, okay? And we're going to go up to Burlington, and we'll sit in on the steps of the federal building, and we'll be arrested, and there'll be a little story in the paper, and at least we will have done something, okay? And these guys were, as I say, just like me, completely clueless. Oh, that's an excellent plan. Let's do that, <laughs> you know? Um, but happily, somebody called up to the police in Burlington, said, what will happen if we carry out this intrepid stunt, you know? And the police said, nothing will happen. Uh, stay there as long as you wish, you know. Uh, uh, we'll come visit you. And, uh, and so we had to recalibrate. And I just started sending out emails. I sent out emails to all people I know. I said, we're going to go for a walk. We're gonna, and we left about two weeks later from Robert Frost's old writing cabin up in the Green Mountain National Forest, because he's kind of our patron saint in Vermont, you know. And we thought that most cliched of all high school English class poems, the one about the road not taken, seemed sort of appropriate. And 
off we walked and we walked for five days and we slept in fields at night. And I'm a Methodist Sunday school teacher, so I'd called up all the kind of Methodist mafia along the way. And we had, you know, went to churches to give talks in the evening and stuff. And finally, we get to Burlington. And we get to Burlington and there's a thousand people marching. Okay? Which, to a New Yorker, is, you know, this doesn't even register. But in... Vermont, with the possible exception of University of Vermont hockey games, it's the most people that there ever are in any one place at one time. It was enormous. I mean, cows were bolting in terror from the fence line as we went by. And it was more than enough to get everybody who's running for Congress and Senate to come down. It's this fall of 2006. Come down and meet with us. We had this big rally by the shore of Lake Champlain. And not only do they meet with us, they signed this piece of raggedy cardboard that we'd been carrying across the countryside that said, I, if elected, I pledge all work to cut carbon emissions 80% by 2050, which at the time was a very radical proposition. It went way beyond anything anybody in Washington was talking about. Only scientists endorsed it. But all these people signed, and not just the liberal Democrats, of whom we have some in Vermont, the, the woman who was running for Congress on the Republican ticket and who almost won, the adjutant general of our state National Guard, she had said two months before when she announced her candidacy, she'd said what people often say. She said, I'm not sure global warming is real. More research needs to be done. The kind of effect that President Kerry was describing in his, some of his talks with his former colleagues. Well, it was useful for us to find out that the more research that needed to be done was, in fact, on the topic, how many people will walk across Vermont and ask me to change my mind, OK? And that the empirical answer was 1,000 is sufficient, you know, because she signed right up. It was useful for us to see that. We were feeling good. But the next day, we opened the newspaper. There's a story in the paper that says, this 1,000 people that gathered in Vermont might have been the largest demonstration that had yet taken place in the United States about climate change. When I read that, I thought, whoa, no wonder we're not doing so good. You know, We have all the things that you would need for a movement. We have great leaders. We have Al Gore. We have all the scientists, all the economists, all the experts, all the policy. The only part of the movement that we've forgotten is the movement part. You know, There's nothing there. And hence, you know, senators and congressmen, whatever, they're very good at telling when you're walking in naked to talk to them, you know. They're quite aware that there isn't anything behind and that there wasn't, you know, that they were a lot more scared of the guy from Exxon than the guy from NRDC or whatever, okay. So we decided to see if we could build something larger outside of funky Vermont. And this part in particular, I'm, you know, as you can tell, the basic subtext here is if someone as clueless as I am can do this, all of you are completely capable of it. And in this case, when I say we decided to do this, I mean me and six undergraduates at Middlebury College. Okay? They were seniors, so they, were, they weren't done with school, but they were more or less done with school. But they, you know, that's, who, that's what we had, and not much in the way of money and no organization, no mailing lists. In January of 07, we started sending out emails to people saying, in April, three months from now, will you hold a demonstration kind of like the one we held with this same demand? Our secret hope, which we didn't tell anybody for fear of being humiliated, was that we would organize 100 demonstrations around the country, which would have been 100 more than there had been before. But instead, it turned out there were people all over the country, including people in this room, who were eager to do something, who had figured out that this problem was not going to be solved one light bulb at a time, Okay, that they wanted to take some political action. And so even though most of them had never organized anything before, they signed up and they did an unbelievable job. And on April 14th, 2007, we had 1,400 demonstrations all across the United States, all 50 states. It was really big, it was really beautiful, and it was remarkably effective. Four or five days later, both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, then contending for the presidency, 
uh, 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 changed their environment and energy platforms dramatically and adopted this 80% by 2050 goal. And you hear Obama talk about it regularly now. So we were feeling, I think the technical word would be smug for what we were feeling, you know. <laughs> Except that six weeks later, the Arctic starts to melt, okay? And by the time it's done, it's enormously clear to us that A, our targets are now out of date, obsolete. Talking about what's going to happen in 2050 no longer makes that much sense. We obviously need change faster and deeper, and now we get this 350 number. It was also clear to us that we were going to have to try to work globally, that we could no longer solve this problem one country at a time, okay? That the time was so short and the change needed so large that trying to organize, say, in anticipation of this big Copenhagen conference was the best possibility. Now, again, there's a certain amount of cluelessness here because really people don't organize globally, almost ever. Um, there's something very quixotic and difficult about it. Pretty much Coca-Cola and McDonald's are the only people who really try, you know? <clears throat> and that's because the world's a big place. It's because the world is hideously divided, as you know, between rich and poor. That's a sin at all times. And in times like this, it's an enormous practical problem because the world looks incredibly different to you depending on where you live in its caste ranking, you know? Um, and just technically, it's very difficult to organize the world because people insist on speaking their own languages everywhere, okay? Very hard. That's one of the reasons that we took this 350 number as our goal. Okay? One of the reasons was because we needed a target, something hard to hold leaders to. We don't need to get our leaders to stand up and say, I will take action on global warming. Okay? That's no longer a useful or sufficient promise. We need them to say, I will take action on global warming commensurate with the scale of the problem. So we need to tell them what that action is, all right? Um, you have to, I, you know, I'm, I'm a parent. You need to be blunt with children and with leaders. They have to understand exactly what's expected of them at all times, or you can't blame them for, you know, misbehaving, all right? Um, so that was good reason for the number, but the other reason was that Arabic numerals cross linguistic boundaries. 350 means the same thing in Beijing and in Barcelona and in Boston, okay? Um, which has proved to be useful. It's proved to be useful enough to overcome the inherent handicap of trying to organize people around an arcane scientific data point, something that hasn't been tried before, okay? Uh, and one would have predicted might not be all that successful. We had no idea how successful this even could be. So this, I, we had the same crew, the seven, you know, me and six young people. That was a good number because there are six main continents, okay? And each one of them took one and dispersed <laughs> and began trying to figure out how to organize it, all right? And within a few months, they'd found people like them, usually young people, in all these places and set to work. And they'd set to work training other young people. And uh, there was a kind of, you know, Amway quality to the thing. We were running these climate training camps in Africa and in Turkey for people from all over Central Asia and on and on and on. I mean, it's been quite remarkable. Hooking up with faith communities around the world with non-traditional, not so much environmental groups everywhere, but all sorts of other people too, because the environmental movement simply isn't big enough or strong enough to take on global warming. It can create national parks, it can defend particular species, it can't take down ExxonMobil, okay? Just not strong enough. We're trying to broaden out all the time. And we set this date of October 24th as our goal and said, here's, we're gonna 
use this date six weeks before Copenhagen to try to drive this number into the debate, to try to make the world realize, try to make this most important number one of the more well-known numbers on the planet. Okay. But we didn't know how well it would work. And it took enormous faith from people, friends and supporters to sort of see it through and, and help provide the resources and things that made it even minimally possible. And what happened was the same thing that happened in this country, but on an even larger scale. It turned out that all over the world, there were people who wanted to take action, creative, interesting, joint action, that given the platform on which to stand to say the same thing, they were eager to say it, and powerfully and loudly. So on Saturday, which actually Saturday begins tomorrow in New Zealand, so beginning tomorrow, There'll be, at, I haven't checked the website for an hour or so, but there'll be 4,600 and some events and rallies and protests in 173 nations around the world. It'll be by far the most widespread day of political action in the planet's history. Okay? And, And it's going to be extremely beautiful because everywhere people are figuring out how to take those numbers and make them real. So there'll be in some big cities, uh, Sydney and New Delhi, I think, we're going to have big crowds of thousands of people making giant human threes. And then in other cities, big fives, London and Quito. And, and then in Copenhagen and some other giant zeros, OK? And, then we'll make BBC and CNN and whatever put them together, this sort of Scrabble game at the end of the day, and you know, make the point. Some of them are beautiful and moving. I was in Bethlehem on this last trip and met with activists from all over the region, and which isn't Bethlehem's not a particularly easy place to meet. Everybody has to cross all kinds of checkpoints and things to get there. And, but everybody sat down and said, here's what we're going to do. The Dead Sea is dwindling fast. In the Israeli shore of the Dead Sea, our activists, the activists there will make a giant human three. On the Palestinian beach, a huge five. In Jordan, a great zero, you know? And really begin to make the point that we might want to lay aside at least a little bit some of our other divisions to concentrate on what's coming at us. All over the planet, in completely unlikely places, people going with this and running with it and doing amazing things. There'll be 300 rallies across China on Saturday. It's not easy to go politically organize in China. It takes a certain amount of guile and a certain amount of bravery to make it happen. And it's all young people. It's mostly on campuses. It's going to be very beautiful. 150 big rallies across India, one of the really key countries as we try to contemplate how the future works. You know. Um, all across Africa. We had a climate training camp in Africa for young people. And most of the people who came had never left their country before, had never been on an airplane before. But for a couple of weeks, we sat and worked on how to organize. And they went back. And not that we really know. I mean, we were sort of telling them you know, what we did in Vermont and how, you know, sort of how to think about it. And they completely figured out how to adapt it to their place. And, went home and on Saturday they'll be big, I mean big, I mean many thousands of people in places like Bujumbura, the capital of Burundi. Uh, tomorrow in Addis Ababa, the, young, the two sisters who came to this climate training went back and apparently they've organized a fun run uh, for 350 with 10,000 high school students going through the streets of Addis tomorrow with 350 signs and things. Uh, uh, with the president there to speak to them. Um, uh, you know, any place in the world that you turn, with the exception of Burma and North Korea, there's something happening. Um, very powerful and beautiful. And as I said before, extremely moving. Nobody in Addis Ababa, nobody in Bujumbura, nobody in these places did a damn thing to cause the planet to warm up. This is not their fault, OK? But they've figured out that in the world that's wired together the way ours suddenly is, they have some chance of playing a role in slowing it down. 
On Saturday, we'll have a little gathering, not a big rally, but just a sort of press conference and gathering to which you're invited if you'd like to come in Times Square. And we're going to have three of the big jumbotron advertising signs. And for the hour that includes 3.50 in the afternoon, we'll be showing pictures uploading that people have been uploading from all over the world up on those signs. And it's very exciting. It's funny how exciting it is when you tell people in Everybody somehow knows about Times Square, and they're like, whoa, that's going to be really cool. Make sure my picture gets up there, you know. Um, um, it, it, it's fun to see. On Monday, we'll be delivering prints of all of those to the UN, to the delegation. We'll have a team of 40 young people that's going to Copenhagen. It's going to be, in this number, we're going to do our best to make absolutely omnipresent. Now, it's not going to carry the day, we're not going to get a perfect agreement out of Copenhagen or a perfect uh, bill or anything even close to it out of Capitol Hill right away. Partly that's because we didn't do the work we should have done 10 and 15 and 20 years ago. And I chew myself out regularly for not having figured out what I should have been doing this a long time ago. Um, it takes a while for movements to build and to have their way and to make the kind of dent that we need to make. And I've been utterly frank with you all through this talk, and I'll be completely frank with you now. There are no guarantees that this is going to work. We've waited a long time to get started. There are scientists who think we've waited too long for anything to work that the momentum of this warming is now at such a point that slowing it down is a fool's errand. Um, the consensus is, although by no means an overwhelming consensus, but the consensus is that there's still a window left open through which we can climb, but it's a narrow window and it's closing. And we'd best get through it rapidly, especially if we plan on pulling as many people as possible along with us. And that's part of what we have to do. That negotiation in Copenhagen will be about two things. One is making sure we get cuts steep enough to protect the planet. The other is to make sure that we get aid enough from north to south to protect poor people everywhere who will be the first and most prominent victims of what's happening. So no guarantees. But I will end just by saying that it's been quite a great privilege the last few months to be around the world and just feel almost viscerally as if the immune system of the planet is beginning to kick in, as if the antibodies that are represented by conscious citizens the world round are beginning to wake up and recognize the threat that there is and go try to figure out how to take what action they can against it. I don't know if we got started in time, but I do know that there are a lot of us now for what time we have to do it, who will do it as hard as we can. Um, it's one of those rare pivot moments in history where the course, not just of decades or centuries, but of geological time will be altered by what we do in the next few years. And so it's a great, great pleasure for me to be in a room full of people who are willing to work on just those kind of things. I thank you for it enormously. So is this working? OK. So we'll both speak into our lapels now. Um, we, we have uh, some time for questions and answers, and we have a couple of microphones down here. So I would encourage you to uh, gather your questions and begin to um, line up. I will, first of all, start off by thanking you, Bill, for um, scaring the shit out of us. <laughs> uh, as is necessary. Um, but also for ending at a, at a point where I think many of us know we have to go, um, I would argue the, the question of whether or not we've gotten started in time is in fact an irrelevant question um, because we, uh, we will do it or we won't. Whether we got started in time doesn't really <laughs> matter. Um, uh, 
Um, but I do, I would like to, to pose the first question and then we'll go right to the audience. Um, uh, and that is, is simply this. I, I think um, the space between engineering and political science, political will, um, is occupied by design. Mm -hmm. And I say that because the world that we live in has been designed to function the way it is. Uh, we may not have consciously thought through all of the implications of what we've been doing, but humans have been transforming the environment for as long as there have been humans, and the net result is the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. And design is, in fact, that conscious decision to change the way things are. Mm -hmm. So uh, climate change, and it won't be a surprise to, to my students and friends in the room, is the greatest design challenge we have ever mm -hmm. faced. But to me, that is also the cause of optimism. And I think that's where you were trying to end as well, which is to say, if we designed it to be the way it is, we can design it to be different. Yes. But I think we should not. I th it's always important to pay. I mean, especially when one's in dire straits, you got to think as clearly as you possibly can about what the sort of steps are. Okay, And so what the root causes of things are. I think that most of the design and most of the other decisions that we've made in this country and in much of the rest of the world is a direct reflection of one variable. That's that we've had endless access to cheap energy. Okay? And that's why you know we've our physical surroundings have sprawled out the way we have. That's why the single passenger automobile has become the thing of choice. That's why, you know, the American dream has basically been reduced for 50 years to building bigger houses farther apart from each other, okay? Um, my guess is that trying to convert, trying to make, I mean, it's very important to figure out how to redesign things and whatever, but that the greatest stimulus to that redesign and to changing the way that we eat, and to doing the two or three other things that are really important if we're going to dramatically lower our energy use, that the greatest stimulus to that will be to figure out the cheap, quickest, easiest, most brutal way to make that happen is to figure out how to make the cost of energy go up, fossil energy, okay? That's what any of these solutions that we're talking about at Copenhagen or at Capitol Hill are basically about about sending a strong enough price signal into the economic system that we get a different set of outcomes. And if that happens, so many things follow, I think. And I think almost all of them are to the good and that they often, they, many of them fall under the sort of rubric of design, at least loosely figured, okay? Um, um, why does our food system look the way it does? It evolved more or less naturally in a world where it was incredibly cheap to pour. I mean, basically we just grow, you know, we use soil to hold our plant upright while we pour oil on it. I mean, that's, you know, basically how agriculture works. And, um, um, uh, you know, at the moment, we have this wonderful network of farmers markets and things, but they have to fight uphill against economic gravity all the time. The minute that the price of energy changes, then the economic wind will be at their backs and we'll see explosive growth in that. You know, uh, uh, you got a sense of this summer before last when the price of gasoline went up for six weeks, went up to somewhere near what Europeans had been paying for 50 years, okay? I mean, the, the Europe, the Europe, Western Europe is better designed than we are. It doesn't have, to, to me, has nothing to do with, you know, Danes being just, you know, different people. It has to do with the fact that energy has been expensive in Denmark for a long time, so people have thought much more carefully yeah. about what they're doing. Well, you know, the price of gasoline went up. I, I've been working on SUV stuff for a long time you know, writing, and there's been sort of prior, it took six weeks of expensive gasoline for everybody in America, you know what? I don't actually need a tank in order to get the groceries. 
when does the bus come, you know? Um, <laughs> questions that we hadn't asked for a very long time, we were suddenly asking. And once we start asking them, they become a, it becomes a, once, you know, once people who used to be in Ford Explorers are on the bus, what do you know, all of a sudden, the bus is going to be a nicer place to be. There's a story in the Times yesterday about how, you know, the new head of the bus system is busy figuring out how to make sure that you can get on and off the bus easily and it's going to be clean and the bus station is going to be nice and whatever because suddenly the, there were enough people with enough political power on the bus that they weren't willing to put up with what the bus had been allowed to become. So yeah, I take your point completely about design, but I think that the one political intervention we can make that's big enough to push whole systems powerfully is the one that makes carbon pay the price for the damage it does to the environment. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Mm -hmm. You can't design in a world without constraints. And that's what you're talking about changing. Um, should we start over here? Uh, Hello, is it working? Hi, yes. uh, my name is Michael Gary and um, Professor McKibben, I wanna thank you for coming and speaking with us and God bless you in your efforts. Um, my question is, uh, based upon that legislation that you talked about, about uh, putting the kibosh on uh, carbon emissions, I think petroleum industry for, for cars, by 2050, mm -hmm. isn't that a recipe for disaster? We're talking about 41 years. Yep, no, 2050 uh, is a, a no longer a meaningful target. Um, you know, it's very clear we need very quick reductions, quickly. Um, uh, the European Union has been talking about uh, the, the Norwegians offered last week to cut their carbon emissions 40 percent by 2020 if the rest of the developed world would go along, which is in one sense almost embarrassing to think about. The Norwegians don't use much energy now. For them to cut 40 percent more, they're going to be cutting deep in the muscle. You know, it's going to be hard. We can get, you know, for us, the first 20% is like losing weight by getting a haircut, you know? It doesn't even really <laughs> do much damage along the way. It's great to see uh, American, you know, feeling the responsibility for our country's contribution and remembering those 25 out of 100 patients mm. in the hospitals who are, um, you know, due to climate change from the dengue fever that you mentioned. Um, but I just wonder, like, how, how we can actually, you know, you, you brought up the number that Dr. Hansen found the it was 300 to 350 i think 350 was the outer edge of mm. what you know gives us a fighting chance right. and um and and dr hansen also um came out you know feeling that same responsibility that you you feel and that a lot of us here feel and said that the existing climate legislation is a disaster uh, um you know the cuts that it uh would make don't begin till 2016 and they're be below the uh, 2005 level, not the 1990 level. Right. And there's a whole, you know, the cap and trade system, which has historically failed, um, is at the heart of it. And you have like principled environmental organizations, you know, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, um, Climate SOS, a, a Rising Tide, who recognize um, that cap and trade is, um, you know, environmentally unjust. You know, it dumps the pollution in poor communities. Uh, it allows people to offset, polluters to offset their emissions. So I'm wondering, I mean, you have like, you know, you've taken on this responsibility and, and um, you seem like to recognize the horrors that, that you've enlightened me about and, and a lot of other people having read your book. And I'm, I'm wondering why you haven't taken that extra step to, to point out that what Bob Carey um, was, was promoting, the Waxman Markey, Carey Boxer, this, this bill that came out of negotiations between, uh, not, not between NRDC and polluting industry, but it came out of their joint participation in the US Climate Action Partnership. The worst polluters and the corporate environmental uh, organizations that have demobilized our movements over the last 20 years. And there he is, and we've got a chance to tell the guy you know, your bill is going to sink our planet. He and and instead I, of saying that it's going to be a start. I talk, so I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, but I know, I know. Well, I, and I had some other things I wanted to talk to that guy about too. Yeah. He might but have seen in any case, there. Just keep that ourselves focused yeah. on that. <laughs> like, so, so why not take that extra responsible step to say what environmentalists are getting all gaga about 
looking at Waxman Markey and saying, we got to do this, now we've, it's going to sink the planet. We've actually, at 350, joined hard with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth in this whole, you've got to strengthen this thing and there's nothing there. And you didn't even actually outline what I think is the single biggest problem with the legislation on the Hill, which is how little it even contemplates doing in terms of aid and transfer of resources north to south. Uh, the EU estimated recently that it would take $100 billion a year in adaptation aid, and that's almost certainly low figure to help the rest of the world deal with climate change that they didn't cause. The uh, Waxman-Markey bill appropriates, I think, $750 million with an M uh, uh, per year to this task. I mean, that's derisory. It's not even... You know, I mean, it's, it's orders of magnitude away from where it needs to be. Um, so we're, that's, you know, and that's why we're working with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and whatever on the kind of left flank of this. We haven't been spending much time on it at 350 just because we're the one crew of people whose main attention is focused globally. Most of our activists, most of our work is headed toward Copenhagen and all over the world. And there are fights like this, you know, there are, particular legislative battles going on in every single country that we work in, and we just don't have the resource. There, I mean, there's, I, I told you before, there's seven of us working full time on this, okay? So we've got our hands full trying to figure out even just how to take these three digits and spread them around the world. So there are, I, I mean, I could list for you approximately a thousand other things we should be doing too, and that we're not. Um, and so I'm glad you're doing, working hard on this one because it needs working hard on. And we'll keep doing what we can um, to help shore up that left flank. And, and we've tended to work with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth in particular a lot along those, that way. But we just don't have the, I mean, capacity is an unbelievable problem in this kind of work capacity of all kinds. You'll really see it when you get to Copenhagen, okay? Here's, I was at Kyoto, so I got to see how this happens, and I've been a lot at these things. We'll get to the last day, and there will be nothing done, and everybody will be scrambling, and the head of the meeting will say, okay, we have eight issues left open. We're going to have eight negotiating sessions going on in these eight conference rooms. Well, the U.S. will have a team of 15 lawyers to go to each room, okay? And the African Union will have if they're lucky, eight people total able to go take part. They'll just be overwhelmed. And that, uh, it's a very hard battle to fight at all times. So more allies, please. More work, please, all the time. Thank you. Um, Mr. McKibben, uh, Professor McKibben, Bill. thank yes. you. Bill, I've been aware of you for 19 of the 20 years since you wrote that book. Um, so John Seed came through town a couple years ago and he encouraged everywhere he went, he came through Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, he encouraged us to form our own groups. New York Climate Action Group was born out of that. And um, I would like to just pose to you the thought that out of this enormous charismatic effort, the three, the five, the zero, that people across the globe whose attention you've already captured in everywhere but North Korea and Burma can know that they can then just take it from there and create a local climate action group. And really quickly, what we're doing here, we've taken on Bloomberg's the city of New York's use of tropical timber. We are the largest end user of tropical timber in North America, here in wow. New York City. And we've been pushing, and we're getting somewhere. It's a little tiny group. I'm not going to even admit how tiny we are, but that was <laughs> about, we're actually, I'll admit, we're the same size as your six people. So. <laughs> We're pushing the city. We're actually to toppling over the structure. So 
I just propose that Absolutely. you take this and run with it. No, more power to you, and it's exactly right. It's exactly what our organizing kind of model is all about. You'll notice that when I described what we did two years ago in 07, what we didn't do and what people originally told us we should do when we were trying to figure out how to do sort of national, people said, you need to do a march on Washington, okay? We didn't have the resources to march on Washington. We thought there was something weird about telling people to drive across America to protest climate change. Um, but mostly, we thought that the world had changed in profound ways, that it was now wired differently, and that it was quite possible to do things powerfully in your own community and then make, knit them together to make them larger than the sum of their parts, okay? So we've used the web now to reach out and organize around the world. And all we've asked people to do is just have some part of it be, you know, use these numbers, because we can take those images and bring them together and make the equivalent of, you know, 15 marches on Washington. But for more, and people can use those same days, and they are using them all over the world, to argue to work for whatever thing they need in their own community. If they're working for bike paths, then they're doing bike rides with 350 bike riders. If they're working for local solar power, they're getting, you know, in uh, Barcelona on Saturday, they'll have 350 solar cookers out on the main plaza making paellas for everybody to eat as they go by, you know. Uh, 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 whatever it is they're doing, you know, they're combining that global and the local. And it's now possible to do that in a powerful way. The one th caution, the one thing we think is really important, though, is to make sure that while we're doing things locally, that there's a coordinated global effort, too, that we all can say on occasions like next Saturday the same thing together. Because the attention span, the sort of ability of political systems to drown out random quiet noise is very strong. You have to really shout, and you can only shout a very limited amount of information, and you've got to shout it as loudly as you can at the same time to have some hope of beating it in, you know, through that system. Even then, it's very hard. I mean, we're having a really devil of a time with press coverage in this country. In the rest of the world, we're doing great. But, you know, in this country, the balloon boy is doing considerably better than, you know, we are at the moment in getting. I, I was threatening yesterday to go tie myself to a balloon and <laughs> float above <laughs> Manhattan. So <laughs> we shall see. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Elena Wasserman. Uh, I'm a student at the New School, and as you're saying, we're all fighting on different battles that are related to the movement. Uh, I'm here because I'm really concerned about a particular issue. It's the potential drilling of the Marcel Shale. Um, as I'm sure most of you know, um, it is a formation that contains natural gas. Natural gas is more energy efficient than oil. However, to uh, drill the formation, it requires a highly uh, energy intensive process that would contaminate our watershed. Uh, New York City watershed is uh, extremely pure, and that's why we're many uh, drinking tap water, because it's very healthy. Um, so uh, I am very concerned about this, and I would want to know how would you um, advise us to organize to stop the drilling? Yeah, I, have, I, I don't know enough about it to know exactly how to advise you to organize, but it's a very interesting question. I, when I was a young reporter at The New Yorker, I once did a story that tracked where everything in my apartment came from. Uh, uh, was, those are the days when The New Yorker ran very long <laughs> stories. Um, and, you know, and so I was in, you know, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico because Con Ed was buying gas from there and in the Grand Canyon, I guess the uranium for Indian Point was coming from. But I spent a long time up in the water system of New York. It really is one of the eight wonders of the world, you know. And so it deserves enormous care. And I guess if I was thinking about how to make people uh, think about that, I would really concentrate hard on reminding people what an amazing thing it is that New Yorkers get to drink unfiltered tap water that wins every 
tasting that you can ever have, you know, uh, 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 how that, and, and that it all arrives without the aid of a pump, you know, it's gravity fed from, I mean, it is, uh, of all the sweet engineering things in the whole world, it's hard to imagine anything much better. And as soon as the third tunnel is, comes online sometime soon, it'll be that much better. And the thought, having spent approximately a zillion dollars building the third tunnel to make you know New York's water supply system secure. It certainly would be a shame to risk it. In so I, that, if I were just off the top of my head trying to think about how to organize, that would be that would be one of the places I'd go and be there. Thank you. So I would just want to announce that people are interested in um, coming with me. Uh, I will be going with other students on November 10th to the public hearing at the Stuyvesant High School um, on Chamber Street. Um, I want to thank you for the amount of time and effort that you are putting into all of this. Uh, somebody who's as dedicated as you, I think, is uh, James Lovelock, the father of the Gaia hypothesis. And as you know, uh, a few years ago, he said that we have already passed the point at which we're able to stop the climate change uh, problem. Uh, if he's correct, do you think that where we should be putting our money is in space shot, uh, shots that can get us off this planet? <laughs> or, if he's only approximately correct, do you think that maybe what we should be pouring our money into is a Manhattan project that really gets us to move and pour money into something other than these crazy carbon transfers that are only going to allow international groups to play yeah. around with make-believe numbers? Okay, so first thing is, let's hope that Jim is wrong, all right? Um, he's been right about a lot of other things in the past. He's been wrong about some things in the past, too. And he's, and he's not doing research on this. Uh, you know, it's sort of his gut feeling. On the other hand, there's really nobody with a much stronger gut sense of how the world works than he. His Gaia hypothesis is one of the most elegant thought experiments in, in there ever was. Um, I'm afraid space shots are not a, uh, you know, likely to be the way out. Um, uh, maybe for the balloon boy. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, look, yeah, I said before, I mean, we're talking about some kind of wartime footing. To, I mean, it's going to take a lot of money. Here's the, I mean, the problem is that it has to happen quickly to be in a use. Given 50 or 60 years, no problem. Everybody knows we're headed in the direction of renewable energy, you know, we'll replace what we need to replace. The system would do it more or less on its own without enormous shoves, okay? And that would be the sensible thing to do. It would be the least cost. It wouldn't, you know, disrupt economic systems, investment decisions, political patterns, people's employment, on and on and on. If we had 60 years, no problem. Since we don't, big problem. It's inherently disruptive to make change on this scale. Fossil fuel is the single most important part by far of the world's economy. Make change on that scale is inherently disruptive. And it's going to take much more leadership than we've had so far. And there's, but the only thing I can say is there's no use just sort of wishing for that leadership and there's really no use blaming politicians for not providing it until we've built the movement that makes them provide it, okay? That's, that's I think, what history indicates how this stuff works, you know? Um, um, you know, everybody knew, every thinking American, if you'd surveyed them in 1955, or most of them, knew that segregation was archaic and immoral. But that did not mean that it was going to go away on its own. People still had to build a movement, get arrested, some of them had to get shot, you know, before we did what was obviously going to happen eventually. All right? That's what it takes. And, and it's no use, you, you know, it's just, there's just no use wishing otherwise or trying to think of some shortcut because I don't think there is one. Thanks. It's a good question.
Um, I'm Diane Buxbaum, and this is for identification purposes only. I do work for EPA Region 2. I'm kind of a lowly staff person. Uh, I'm also conservation co-chair of the New York City Sierra Club, and by the way, I've already handed in my comments on the Marcel Marcellus Shale. Um, I just want to say that what scares me is that as a lowly staff person sitting in on our climate change group, not an official member yet, but in, the, in sitting in, we're talking about adaptation, and that really, really frightens me. It's almost like we've written off the possibility of making it not happen. Right. And the other thing is Gus Speth wrote an article, I think in October 2008, and one of the final things he said, and, and I can't, I'm terrible about quoting, is that it's time for us not to just talk anymore, but to do what you're doing, and even more. He were, used the word civil disobedience in that article. And if I pay my mortgage off, I'm going to be civilly disobedient. And maybe I'll do it without it. Well, that's it. good for you. I think that, in fact, that may well be where we were going. We were talking earlier today. There was a few of us here in this room who had the great pleasure of doing, getting to participate in the first really big climate civil disobedience in this country, which was last March in Washington, D.C. And it was a funny, interesting story. It turns out that uh, Capitol Hill, that the Congress has its own power plant. Uh, who, who knew? I really didn't. And for 103 years, it's burned coal. It's like two blocks from the Capitol, okay? Big, ugly, hulking thing. It doesn't show up in any of the pictures you've ever seen of Congress, but there it is. And so we decided this was too good an opportunity not to pass up. Number of groups and things working on it. Last, this time last year, Wendell Berry and I, one of my great heroes and great friends, we sent out a letter asking people to come and illegally encircle this plant in a day in March and, and see what would happen, more or less, okay? And we did it with a certain amount of hesitation because civil disobedience is a tough is a tactic you've got to use carefully, okay? And it too often and too easily degenerates into people taunting the police and making trouble and just being stupid in every way. So the thing that Wendell and I said in this letter was, if you want to come to this thing, you have to wear your Sunday best clothes, okay? Because we're going to, what we said in the letter was, we're going to show people who the real radicals are, that they're the people who are doubling the carbon content of the atmosphere, you know, and, and not those of us trying to conserve something like the world we once knew. But we also just wanted to try to drive away people for whom that would be, you know, that would be hard for them, <laughs> okay, um, to, to just philosophically engage. And so it was turned out to be a wonderful day. Thousands of people showed up. So many people showed up that the police refused to arrest any of us because there were too many. They said, we've got too many. We can't, we can't, can't fill the whole jail with other people doing bad things in Washington. You know, we have to leave some room. So, uh, but we were able to sort of walk away with our heads held high because we got a letter from uh, Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi who own this stupid thing saying, okay, we're going to stop burning coal. And two weeks later, they shut down the coal-fired power plant, you know. So, uh, you know, one down, 600 to go, but, uh, but it was an interesting moment. And I will say, uh, you're at exactly the right stage in life to be. Uh, I got arrested in the first civil disobedience about climate, I think, in the whole country, many, like 10 or 12 years ago. And it was completely pointless and premature and everything. The only reason that, and unstrategic, but the only reason that happened was because this old, this old friend of mine, a woman named Granny D, who some of you may have heard of, who walked across America at the age of 90, for like three miles at a time, okay? She walked across America to protest this, and she got to uh, uh, Washington, and she called up and said, Billy, you have to come, we're, we're, we're having a, uh, uh, we're going to have a little protest and I need you to be there or whatever. Well, you know, as I say, I'm a Methodist. I'm a well-raised. If somebody who's 93 tells me that I'm to do something, I go generally and do it. <laughs> and so we went down to, and we, you know, we held this little sign, she and I in the rotunda of the Capitol that said, stop 
global warming, stop campaign contributions from global warmers. The rotunda of the Capitol is closer than they actually wish you to exercise those free speech rights and things. So we were, in fact, it was very funny because we were, uh, they, we, they handcuffed us together. She's like four foot ten, okay? So, you know, we're like <laughs> this. And, and she looked up at me. She has emphysema, which makes the whole like walk across America thing even more insane. She looked up, hey, you know, I'm 93. I've never been arrested before. I should have started long ago. <laughs> so you're on, you're on the right path. Hello, um, my name is Lily. I am a freshman at NYU and um, I'm taking a class. You might know her, Jillian Warren. Do you know her? Okay, that's my professor. I believe um, she's sitting in yonder. I believe I <laughs> oh, see her over there, in fact. <laughs> well, um, what we've been discussing is um, the biodiversity of the planet, and, um, and I, I know you that you, you, the main thing that you've been talking about is like the impact that global warming is going to have on humans, but what can we do as people who love nature and love the planet to protect its biodiversity and its habitats? The only thing we can do is try to slow down the progress of this warming. There's going to be a lot of damage done to human beings and to natural systems. We're already losing a lot of species, and we're going to lose a lot more, and it's going to be wickedly painful to watch in all kinds of ways. Okay? Um, everything is relative. The best we can do is the best we can do. And the more we can slow the whole thing down, the more of the planet's DNA will survive the century intact. You know, that's, it, it, I mean, there's plenty of particular interventions that one can make in particular places. We can build wildlife corridors. We can allow things to migrate more easily north and south. We can, you know, things like that. All helpful. The bottom line is if we let the planet heat five or six or seven degrees, the species extinction consequences will be at least as great as the last time one of the big asteroids slammed into the planet, except this time the asteroid is us, you know? Um, um, so it's, it's really where I, in some level, began thinking about all this back when I was writing The End of Nature, you know? Uh, it was my sense of just overwhelming sadness, not of fear, not of anger, just of incredible sadness at how this unbelievably beautiful place, and unbelie I, mean, I was living in the middle of the Adirondacks, so for me, this unbelievably wild place was just not so wild anymore, and increasingly going to be less and less. I so let me just say one more thing. Along with all the other work that we got to do, and you know, we got to do it. We got to do this kind of work I'm talking about. We got one of our other jobs, one of your jobs, is to pay attention, bear witness to the beauty of the world around you right now. Okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to see it more intact in the future than it is right now. So take some time and pay some attention. And the cost of that's not is high sometimes, you know. Um, because you're bearing witness to something that's in desperate trouble. But it's also one of those deep human tasks to which we're called. We're able to do that job, and there's something incredibly important about doing it. So thank you very much. We'll see you out on the trails. We have time for just a few more, I think, so if we could keep the question. Sure. Hi, I'm Melanie. I was actually at the um, Capitol Coal Plant with ah, a you. hole in my shoe on a <laughs> snowy day. Um, thank you so much for being part of making that happen. And I, I'm a visual artist. I really appreciate the creativity that's happening around October 24th okay. and making it a gleeful, joyous, celebratory day toward action. I also am a cranky person and know you know, Mark Twain has that wonderful quote that um, someone will not see or understand something if their salary is dependent on them not understanding it. So I'm curious um, 
if you guys have a secret plan to transform all this creative celebratory action into the action of nonviolent civil disobedience, um, which will, will yeah. No secret plan, and, and, <laughs> um, and we don't really have any plan at all. One of the things that's clear about, to me about this kind of work it, it, though not much is clear, I mean, as you can tell, I'm completely making it up as I go along, and uh, you know, other people are good at it too, or making it up as they go along. It's it's about reading the moment and figuring out what the moment allows and where you are politically and and all of that. And one of the things we have to do. If, if we're going to go do civil disobedience, one of the key, uh, I think, when you look back at Gandhi's work or Dr. King's work or whatever else, one of the key lessons that those sort of giants is that you had to prepare the ground carefully first. You had to make very sure that you'd done everything you could to educate people, to make it clear what your very reasonable demands of the system were, so on and so forth. Um, it's very hard to do effective civil disobedience or any other kind of movement building when there isn't a consensus about where it is you're headed. And this is a particularly hard question to do that on because it's not, you know, segregation was so profoundly and obviously evil and it's so directly affected so many people who could be mobilized to do something about it that that it, that it, in that sense, was easier. In other senses, it was much harder. Nobody's going to shoot you for talking about climate change, you know. Um, um, we'll see where we are in six months or a year, and it won't be up to me. It'll be, you know, the sort of answer at some level will emerge out of where we are in the zeitgeist, um, what the politics looks like. We have no idea. I mean, going into Copenhagen, it's a very strange thing. The international political situation is way more fluid. Than, I mean, normally, in international negotiations at this time, when you're six weeks out, everybody basically knows what the deal's going to be and how it's going to be hammered out and what's going to happen and all of that. Nobody has a clue right now how it's going to come down and what's going to happen. I mean, we know enough to know that it's not going to be great. Okay, But whether it's going to happen at all remains very much a question. And, you know, what comes out of that will help inform the debate. I, I wish I had some secret master plan, but I'm much too feeble for that. Um, uh, uh, there are probably people who do, and they're probably smarter at this than I am. Well, I know that I think December 12th, there will be the day of nonviolence There'll be rallies planned. in places on December 12th, absolutely. So. The one thing I do think is that we've got to be, whatever we do, we have to be very careful not to fall into the trap of just saying, we want action on global warming, okay? I don't think that's a useful thing. I think it's useful to say 350 is an important number. I think it's useful to say, shut down that coal plant, okay? I don't think it's useful to just say, I'm, I'm and that's why, you know, that's why we're so fixated on this number, you know? It has some actual meaning that harder to co-opt than, than that. That's all I got. Hello, um, I'm Maggie. I'm an environmental studies and journalism senior from down the street at NYU. Fantastic. And I have to thank you because Deep Economy was one of the books that definitely shaped the way I look at so many environmental and social problems. And you have me sold on local living while having a global <laughs> consciousness, you did it. There you go. But my question is, how do we do that in a place like New York? Like, I mean, we need to make people pay for carbon so that the system can fix itself almost, but we couldn't even pass congestion pricing here. So what, can, like, what actions can we take to have the most consequence? Well, look, I mean, you sort of answered the question yourself. You didn't pass congestion pricing yet, you know? Yeah. But but it only failed by a little bit, and it only failed because, as I understand it from talking to people in Albany, at the last minute, a huge infusion of money from 
garage owners in the city, parking garage owners managed to tip the balance. Talk about setting public policy in an insane fashion, you know, to sort of determine public policy by the, you know, for the sake of the, whatever tiny percentage of people who own parking garages, you know. So you got to fight it again and you got to fight it harder, you know. I mean, it's a great, that's one of those things that would redesign New York in a powerful way. And in fact, the answer for, I mean, I, my friend Charlie Komanoff, uh, who I really, who's one of the smarter guys I know in the city, he, uh, he uh, with uh, Ted Keel's behest, produced this report saying, the problem with the congestion pricing thing, it didn't go far enough. Um, it didn't charge enough money, and hence, the, the benefit wasn't, so he said, instead of charging, he, he did all the computer modeling to say, instead of charging $8 for a car to come into Manhattan, charge 16, okay? That raises the opposition to it from commuters. On the other hand, you now have enough money to make bus and subways free for everybody in New York, all right? All of a sudden, every, you know, what assemblyman in Brooklyn is gonna vote against free bus and subway fare for their constituents, you know? Uh, bold thinking, you know, I mean, I mean uh, New York is in a remarkably good place to do really dramatic things. Um, it's already, of course, a quite green city by comparison with the rest of the country, just because of its hemmed in, you know, the fact that it was an island and it couldn't sprawl out forever and the, you know, all that, densification. And that's turned out to be what people like about it, and so it's, you know, it's retaining it. But there's incredible possibilities for all kinds of clever redesign on much larger scale than we do. And you see how excited people get by even relatively very small interventions, the High Line or something, you know, it's like, whoa, that's cool. So now let's think about how we make things like that happen on a scale big enough to, to really matter. I think you're in a, I think this is a perfect place to try to really engage that politics in a serious way. I think it's, it would be lots of fun. And you know that it's possible because all you have to do is go visit Copenhagen or Stockholm or something. I mean, you know, now in Copenhagen, 30 or 40 percent of people commute to work on bicycles. So it's not, you know, it, and it's, the climate's the same as ours. There's probably more hills than there are in New York, you know. There's no reason that it can't happen here. It, but there's no, there's just no shortcut to doing the political work to make it happen. Sadly, we have only time for one more question. You get the last word. Well, Bill, you'll get the last word. But. <laughs> oh, hi, my name is Sonia Thamaya. I'm an international student from India at the New School. I'm in the, in the nonprofit management program. <clears throat> you mentioned in your talk that um, Bangladesh, which has something like 300 million people, is responsible for, you know, the, the emissions constitute maybe a rounding off error. So, you know, being aware that there are enormous differentials in terms of the responsibility for climate change and in terms of the effects of climate change and who's going to feel them first, um, and also in terms of who has the resources and the technology. Um, I'm wondering what 350.org is doing, how you're addressing those differentials in your campaigns, and, and I guess essentially what I'm asking is, did you maybe think of assigning two of the seven people to the US instead of in one per continent? Well, we've now got actually people all over the place, and the biggest of the 4,600 actions that'll happen, about 1,800 are across the U.S. So we've worked very, I mean, this is clearly the belly of the beast and the heart of the problem. But one of the things that has to happen, even to get change to happen here, is a very strong sense for Americans and for American leadership that this has become the great foreign policy issue of the world, that they feel pressure from the rest of the world to do something about it, okay? I mean, Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize, all right? Well, he's, you know, he, he's going to have to, I mean, for my money, beating George Bush was more than enough to warrant the Nobel Peace Prize, <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, 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 He's going to have to earn it now, you know, and we're going to have to sort of say, here's what it involves, you know. It involves meeting the just demands of the rest of the world. So our, although we've, you know, we, we don't have a long list of what technologies or laws or whatever we endorse, the 
two things we've said all along are tough caps on carbon and really, really tough levels of expenditure to transfer technology and resources north to south. Our partners from the very beginning have been these really wonderful people, this thing called the Greenhouse Development Rights Network, okay, who've been making this case more profoundly than anybody else. It's been very interesting to watch what's happened internationally in the last couple of years. And the developing countries have emerged as the most important, you know, much more potent and powerful force on this issue. Frankly, for a long time, developing countries tended to view it as a way to get more aid, all of it richly deserved and 10 times over from the, from the West, okay? In the last year or two, as the science has become more clear, country after country has come to realize that there's not enough aid in the world to deal with the change that's coming, okay? That they have to get dramatic cuts in emissions from the North too in order to accomplish, in order to survive. My, I spent the, um, a week this summer, a couple of days this summer in the Maldives in the Indian Ocean um, and made great friends with the president there, Mohammed Nasheed, who's a wonderful guy, one of my, my favorite world leader uh, at the moment. And we explained to him, you know, I, he, I mean, it was very funny. He, we, we, I sat down to talk with him and we, uh, and I started into my talk about climate change. And he said, I, said, I know all about this. You know, I know it's very bad. Maybe we should use violence instead of nonviolence. <laughs> he said, no, no, just kidding. But, uh, 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 and then I explained this 350 thing. He said, oh, I know what we're going to do. I'm going to train my whole cabinet in scuba. And we're going to have an underwater cabinet meeting, which we, they had last Saturday, to pass this 350 resolution to send to Copenhagen. This is a country that may not be there in 50 years, that sets aside money from its budget each year, in the th and they're, they're very poor, on the theory that they're going to have to buy a new homeland someday. God knows where, you know. Um, um, the stakes on this stuff couldn't be higher. And there's no way, not any way, that we can solve it without also taking a big step towards solving this divide in wealth and poverty between North and South. That's, I said before, that's always been a grave injustice. Now it's an unbelievable practical impediment to getting done that which needs to get done. So maybe where morality has failed, pragmatism will be more successful in helping deal with that. If we can't, then we're out of luck. Thank you all enormously. So, we, we couldn't end on a more appropriate note of um, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Thank you.